A full audit is coming to the Michigan 2020 election. Beto blames powerful memes for incredible performance by Trump. And Michael Moore calls for Joe Biden to embrace socialism. We've got that and much more coming up, and it starts right now. Hey, we made it to Friday. Welcome to the news and why it matters. I'm Hillary Kennedy. I'm still filling in for Sarah Gonzalez, who is on maternity leave. We did make it through another roller coaster week, and luckily we can end the week on a high note because I am here with Mr. Dave Rubin, host of the Rubin Report here on Blaze TV. We're glad to have you in town with us. It's good to be with you guys. Have we made it through a week officially? <laughs> well, okay, what is the quite. official <laughs> cutoff for the week? Like, do we say like Friday, eight o'clock? You can go out for it. Well, I guess in this town, Dallas. Yeah, I can go out for a drink. You know, I come. I come from LA, and uh, where it's just you know <laughs> Some still people complete are still right lockdown. in the middle of it. Yeah, but it is good to be here with you guys. Really, it's nice to be in a little bit of a freer state and we shook hands before we did did we shake hands or? uh no Come oh on. my god we should oh that's so how scary about that, man? That, that was terrible you might even hug before you leave who knows we'll do wow. it get crazy. Hug. we'll do a little <laughs> group hug we'll well, escalating it. by hillary yeah. here i don't know what's going on getting uncomfortable and then mr stubergear host of stew does america and bitcoin enthusiast <laughs> yes so. i guess i'm well i'm enthusiastic about it when it goes up Right. <laughs> uh, because that's always a fun time. I've been finding all these neat little facts out about you. <laughs> all right, so let's start with what's going on in Michigan. So Republican legislators in Michigan, they're requesting a full audit of the 2020 general election before any of the results are officially certified. And this was done by state senators Lana Thies and Tom Barrett. Um, they sent these letters to the Michigan Ser Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, and then to the Michigan Board of Canvassers because they want these multiple allegations of voter fraud and election crimes made in affidavits filed by the Trump campaign and others reviewed. They said every citizen deserves to have faith in the integrity of the election process and its outcome. It's our responsibility as elected public servants to assure the people of Michigan of the process's integrity through complete transparency transparency, faithful investigation. Um, it also says, you know, these allegations include ineligible ballots, counting late ballots after illicitly predating them, illegal ballot duplication, barring the Republican poll challengers from observing uh, the absentee ballots coming in, things like that. So now some of these voter fraud claims have been disputed by the Michigan election officials. They're saying that Dominion voting system machine glitch. They're saying that that was just attributed to human error, um, that it didn't actually affect the, the number of votes or the outcome. There are so many allegations to look into. It's kind of overwhelming, but do you feel like people are even paying attention to this anymore? Yeah, well, it depends what you watch, right? It depends, do you, do you watch The Blaze? Do you watch my show? Do you watch alternative news sources? Or do you just pay attention to The New York Times and CNN? Because let's not forget, The New York Times just two days ago, front page of The New York Times, in effect, the election is good to go. There's nothing <laughs> to set. see here. <laughs> yeah. I'm slightly uh, using a little poetic license there. But, but that is the bigger problem. It's like everything that they laid out there, maybe there are some issues, and we all should obviously care about election integrity, but the powers that be are basically telling us there's nothing to see behind the curtain, and yet we're all seeing these strange videos. Right before we started, I showed you this video out of Georgia where this woman who's an election observer can't get within six feet. So she's observing something that she can't even see. So she <laughs> is an observer, but she has no idea what she's observing. These are real things. That in and of itself doesn't mean that there is anything wrong. Uh, but I, you know, one of the things I've been saying on my show is that this is also a moment where we're seeing the strength and weakness of the United States because our strength is that we have states who can do things differently and you can choose where to live and hopefully that's more in line with, with whatever your values are and that sort of thing. But it also means that we're gonna have these really different systems of how we go about voting and you know, we don't have hanging chads anymore, but we could have hanging chads in one state and electronic in this state and you know, like in Pennsylvania, they, they let you, if it's not postmarked by the election, they'll still count it. And, and weird things, and it's like, we, maybe we do need something that's more consistent, but asking the questions 
is not evil, and they're trying to make it sound like if you ask the questions, mm -hmm. you're evil or you're a conspiracy theorist or something like that. Sorry, that was my alarm to show up to this show. So. That was <laughs> you're you're <laughs> making me question whether my phone is turned off. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to see all these, because there's so much stuff on the internet, right? And, and you don't know what to trust. You don't know what's real. There's obviously some things that are real and some things that aren't. We're lucky enough in this particular circumstance, though, to have a really well-designed filter, which is a candidate with unlimited resources who has a real incentive to find out what the truth is. And you can look at what the, the Trump campaign is doing. You know, there's been like a lot of these videos that go around and the Trump campaign is not filing lawsuits based on these videos. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're basing their lawsuits on totally different things. That's the stuff to watch. This, this will not be one on social media. It will be not be one on talk shows. It will be one if it's going to be overturned in some way, it's gonna be one in the courts. And the Trump campaign uh, luckily has, uh, you know, a, they've got a billionaire candidate, which is a nice thing to have in a situation like this. Uh, and they have a lot of resources and a lot of people who love Donald Trump that are, you know, giving him money to make sure that they can go out and fight these things. Um, so there is a, there is a, I think, an attention span issue with the American people that yeah. will start to fade relatively soon. Uh, so if they have, if they've got something, you know, uh, whatever they have, they're going to have to come out with, I don't know, within the next week or two. Because I'm already feeling this from people that I know who right after the election were like, I can't believe this. We've got to fight this all the way. Now it's like, I don't know why. Maybe maybe he just won and let's 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 move on. Yeah. It, I think people are starting to fade a little bit already. So they, they need to, to make this happen and, and just make sure that they're doing things uh, that have a realistic chance of success. And I think the American people want votes counted. They want the right result. Even, I, you know, look, we know a lot of Democrats who don't want the right result to come <laughs> out, but there are a lot of Democrats who do. I mean, yeah. I think the average Democrat is like, I, I, I know a, I would, if Joe Biden wins this election fair and square, I want Joe Biden to be the president. I mean, I want the process to, it's more important than any one man to me. Uh, so I think most people are in that position. We just have to make sure that we don't let partisan stuff on either side, you know, run this thing out of control. Agreed. Well, the Trump campaign has released 234 pages of affidavits regarding alleged voting irregularities in Michigan. So here's a couple of examples of what they say. Um, there was a woman named Alexander Seeley. She claimed that she challenged 10 votes at a given table and those challenges were not recorded. She claims the poll workers would not take out the log to record her challenges. Um, one person claimed that at 4.50 a.m. they witnessed a man spraying a chemical on a ballot counting machine. He then placed 27 ballots into the machine and uh, this person noticed tape on top of the ballot where a ballot number would normally be. She said she saw the ballots inserted, the same 27 ballots inserted into the machine at least five times. So there's things like that. Um, one, one woman said, Cynthia Brunel claimed that a table she observed 11 ballots that would have been rejected due to irregularities, but only four were rejected. The other seven were scanned through the machine. So there's quite a few instances like that. And again, Michigan is saying, well, a lot of this is human error, and some people are saying, no, this is, you know, a, 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 deep, a deep plot that's going on, so. But by the way, human error can <laughs> be bad. <Yeah. laughs> it's not just error, like, oh, it was just human error, so, like, let's not look at it. Like, you could have a lot of human error, and that could cause a Sway real problem. Election. Absolutely. Yeah. They're saying signature verification wasn't being done from time to time, or they didn't see it being done because they weren't able to observe properly. So do you think that if the Trump campaign continues to focus on this, do you think they are going to lose support from their from their base if they just keep focusing on all of this? Well, I think what you said about a certain amount of fatigue does sit, set in at some point. I think in many ways we were all kind of ready for the election to be over on election night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. Even for us mm -hmm. that we live in this world, but it's like, okay, let's have an election, have a result, and if it's not the result that we want, then okay, we go back and, and we think about stuff and we figure out how to move forward. The idea that this has rolled on, and then I know we're gonna talk about it a little bit, but like now that it's suddenly COVID is really ramping up too. And I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but like, it's like, maybe there is something here with some of these irregularities and they just don't want us talking about it. So the media keeps telling us there's nothing to see here, but it, that's not enough to go, there's nothing to see here. They also go, and by the way, grandma's about to die. And if you have Thanksgiving with more than six people indoors and blah, 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 <laughs> you're gonna kill everybody you know. So the media has just completely, I mean, and regardless of what happens with Trump in the long term. If Trump did one thing well, he exposed them for what they are. And at least 70 million people now see that, and I, I think it's more than that. So it's like they, they hide the truth, but they go, that's, that's kind of not enough. We can't just hide the truth because they'll start thinking and they'll start talking. We also got to make them crazy and let's lock them down again and make them think that they're going to die. And the question is, does Trump have enough 
enough gas left at this point? And is there enough momentum to fight through that? Again, to just get to the courts, and then if the courts say there's nothing here, so be it, Biden will be president, I'll be moving into a bunker, you guys are welcome to join me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's a, tough, it's a tough challenge for Trump, right? Like, this is not an easy thing for him to do. I mean, we're, we know for, for certain that hundreds, if, if not thousands of votes were either screwed up or were, there was fraud involved in them. And that, you can apply that to a lot of elections, right? That's not just mm -hmm. singular to this, this election. Um, you know, the Trump administration in Pennsylvania was arguing uh, to the court, they were saying that, like, look, we're not even accusing uh, fraud here. What we're accusing of is they mishandled these ballots and treated them legally and correctly. You know, that's a different standard. You know, a lot of these challenges that they have are for smaller amounts of votes, 200 votes, 500 votes. And it, the issue is because they need three full states to turn over, they're really going to need to find something systemic over a, a large swath of votes. There's been a lot of theories out there about that. Nothing's really come to fruition yet, but who knows? Um, I'm looking for it because I want to make sure that this, this actually happened the right way. But it's going to be tough for him to chip away a few hundred votes at a time because, I mean, look, you know, Michigan is a, is a good example of this. It's not a particularly close result. I mean, it's a, you know, 140,000 votes or something like that. Um, you know, uh, where Wisconsin was much closer, only about 20,000, uh, Georgia closer, Arizona closer, Pennsylvania, not really, uh, uh, you know, close in the percentage terms, but not that close in the vote total. It's difficult to do. They have a, a really tough lift and they're working against the clock. So I would do not, you'd rather be Biden in this situation right now if, you, if you're talking about wanting to be president. He's, he's gonna be considered the favorite. It's gonna be hard to overturn these things, but we deserve to know who actually won. And you know, give the president respect for fighting uh, f for these things, even though it probably, at this point, I would assume even for him, it's just like, oh, all right, I'll go back to being a billionaire married to a supermodel. I can mm -hmm. handle it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just real quick add one thing to that, which is that if in terms of hand counts, it's hard to find all of those votes. But if the software, yeah. and again, this is if, software can change stuff in massive numbers really that's quick. That's the systemic and I'm not, thing. Right, yeah. that's mm -hmm. the systemic thing. That's the, that's the oh, 20,000 votes can be changed like that. 200,000 votes can be changed like that. So I'm not sitting here saying that's what's happening, mm -hmm. obviously. But if he's got that smoking gun somewhere, and he did tweet out in all caps yesterday, this, this report about Dominion Software flipping all these votes. It's like, well, either he just went in all in on the crazy, or he knows what he did yesterday. You know what I mean? That tweet where he was basically saying they're actually flipping hundreds of thousands of votes and throwing out hundreds of thousands. So we may find out which one Trump is doing. Is he going all in on conspiracy? Or does he actually know something? And if you just look at his track record, it's like he usually tests things out on Twitter <laughs> first, and then you find out that they're kind of right later. So yeah, and this is a good thing. We, we're going to know this, right? Yeah. This isn't going to be something we have to guess at for the next twenty years. We'll know, at least it, we'll know the pragmatic effects of it within the next few weeks. He's going to have to do if he's got this. He's going to come have to bring it to the courts and, and be able to turn it over. And he might, you know, who knows? Um, it's interesting though that the this Dominion software thing was something the Democrats were complaining about years ago. I mean, this is something that they really were the ones complaining about because they had this sort of theory about 2004 mm -hmm. in a different circumstance slightly with John Kerry in one state in Ohio where they said, you know, this all these votes got flipped and we can't trust these voting machines. So they were kind of the first one to bring that sort of approach to the table. And then they specifically cited uh, Dominion for uh, having worries about security. The left did this, did this before. Now, of course, they love Dominion. They're the greatest company of all <laughs> and time. Right. More Orwellian than Dominion. Yeah. How about just like bow forever <laughs> yeah. computer systems? Like, come on, man. Well, we only have one minute, but it is interesting that President Trump has reportedly told some of his advisors that if Joe Biden is certified the winner of the election, he's going to announce a 2024 campaign shortly afterwards. <laughs> and also, you know, there's been all of this talk about him launching a media endeavor of some sort. Um, so if he does that, do you think launching this TV network um, while he's kind of campaigning for 2024 will ultimately help him? Dude, take a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> take a vacation, go down to Mar-a-Lago, sit with the people. Yeah. He you is know, a machine. Like, I get he it, really but is. like, I, look, I wouldn't put anything past him. Would I put 2020, he would be 78 by the time, you know, his first term would be Younger around, than or, Biden. Which is, <laughs> no, I, well, mentally younger, but <laughs> technically a year older, but like, oh, younger than Joe Biden yeah, at the yeah. time, right? Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but think about it, Joe Biden's 77 now, and we all know something ain't right. <laughs> yeah. So Biden would, uh, J uh, Trump would be 78 at the time. But it's like, maybe after this, I don't know, I don't know. Can you tell this guy what to do? Nobody has ever told him what right. to do, and I don't think it's gonna start now. Either way, he's probably not slowing down anytime soon. Yeah. 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 All right, so we have to go to break first. I wanna talk to you about 
all those things, you know, the things that we would love to do for ourselves, but haven't done them for, you know, whatever reason. Well, thanks to Candid, straightening your teeth is simpler and it's easier and it's more comfortable than ever. Candid has clear aligners that are comfortable, they're removable, they're practically invisible, unlike wire braces, so you can transform your smile without anyone noticing. Plus, your treatment is prescribed and it's monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist who's an expert in tooth movement, and it's all done from the comfort and convenience of your own home. So Candid only works with orthodontists, never general dentists like other companies. Plus, your supervising orthodontist will be with you every step of the way. With Candid, your treatment includes remote monitoring by the same orthodontist who created your plan, so you never have to wonder how you're doing. You'll always know, so I love that. And the average Candid treatment, it's just six months, so you'll start seeing results way before then, and it costs thousands less than braces. So start straightening your teeth today. Right now, all listeners can save $75 on Candid Starter Kit. Go to candidco.com slash why and use code why. That's candidco.com slash why, code why, and take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 on your starter kit. That's candidco.com slash why, code why. We'll be back in a minute. You know, Democrats have really been picking up the pace in the past two weeks, and it seems like uh, Senate Judiciary Committee ranking member Dianne Feinstein, she's been busy. She's written a letter to Chairman Lindsey Graham urging her colleague to stop processing President Donald Trump's judicial nominees. Now, she says that the panel should hold off on this kind of business now that the election's over and allow Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden to make his own picks. She said, now that the 2020 election has concluded, it's clear the American people have overwhelmingly rejected a second term for President Trump. She said, you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they're already implementing their transition plan. And she said there's precedent behind her argument. She said the committee's long and established tradition in presidential election years is to halt consideration of judicial nominees after election day. Now there's only been two exceptions. Uh, once in 2004, following President George W. Bush's re-election, and once in 2012, following the re-election of President Obama. Here's what she wrote, though. She said, unlike Presidents Bush and Obama, President Trump has lost his re-election bid. Now, Lindsey Graham had already scheduled a nominations hearing for next week prior to this letter. But why do you think the Democrats are so scared of new judges? Because <laughs> they're not going to be the ones that they like, mm -hmm. are they? Um, you know, I, you know. I understand this is a, a valiant effort from uh, Miss Feinstein uh, to to go after this. It's not realistic, right? I mean, you should be able to. You're president for a four-year term. You don't start till January 20th. It doesn't end until January 20th. So in that time, there's no reason why they can't uh, confirm judges. I obviously understand why they're asking for this, right? I mean, you know, they, they had this nice little moment uh, with, the, uh, with, with her and, and Lindsey Graham at the, after the last hearing with Amy Coney Barrett, where they, they hugged. Uh, he, she said that it was a good hearing, which was a, the worst thing you could ever say to the Democrats. <laughs> like, like they all like almost revolted over it. Uh, so I don't know if she's trying to kind of cash that check and say, hey, we had a good relationship. Remember that? Let's be bipartisan and let us, you know, don't, don't confirm anybody we don't like. It's not realistic. I mean, I think the, the Republicans are going to go forward and get these judges in. It's been the pr main priority, really, and probably the top accomplishment, you could argue, of the Trump uh, presidency. So I don't, I don't think there's any hope in this one for her. Yeah, well, in essence, it's just a lot of talking because, as you point out, you're president for four years. You, you don't stop becoming president for those last three months. And by the way, uh, the woman that they made a saint, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she even said that you're president for four years and that you're supposed to uh, you know, nominate judges. In that mm -hmm. case, she was talking about the Supreme Court, that it's your job to do it. Now, uh, do I have any doubt that the Republicans would be doing the exact same thing if it was a Democrat outgoing president potentially replaced with a Republican? Of course, like the, the hypocrisy knows no bounds. So they would all be doing that. But that's just not how it works. That, that's just theatrics. Like if you've got the power to put the judges in and you're, and especially now where you're potentially running out of time and we've got a really, what I think will be a, a very radical left government in place because I don't think Biden is really anything. He's just the he's just the host for the alien that's living in his belly that's going <laughs> to burst forth looking like Ilhan Omar on January 21st. Um, if, that, if, that, if I'm right about that, then, then the Republicans should do everything they can to get as many judges in as possible. That's just that's just reality. As I said, it would be being done the other way if their situation was reversed. For all the, the numbers people out there that want to know, um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, confirmed 
53 circuit court judges were appointed by Trump in three and a half years. And for comparison, Obama confirmed 55 in all eight years of his presidency. So for all judges, Trump has now confirmed 200. George W. Bush had 197. Bill Clinton, 186. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about Beto O'Rourke. Must he's, we? Yeah, well, I think we must. Uh, <laughs> because it's interesting, he's blaming powerful memes and then democratic incompetence for the incredible performance of Trump among Mexican Americans. He wrote this in a letter to his supporters yesterday. He said, you know, the asymmetrical advantage that Trump and the GOP had in this cycle in Texas is far more powerful than many of us understood. He basically said, you know, he, well, he blamed the Democratic Party for ignoring the border state. He said that the GOP had an effective disinformation campaign via text and social media that helped to explain Trump's phenomenal performance in Texas border counties, counties that happen to be 85 to 95 percent Mexican-American. And then he just said Democrats failed on social media. He said, we have to be far more effective on digital and social media. The anecdotal takeaway from those I've listened to, especially in border communities, is that Trump and the GOP had a ferocious game, which he called lies and powerful memes, effective at targeting new and young voters. And he said, we had none. So he just said Republicans had a more compelling economic message um, and said if you know Democrats are willing to put in the work, they can also have a phenomenal performance the next time. So do you think that he's correct in saying that that was part of what was so effective? Well, if the question here is whether Republican memes are better and conservative <laughs> memes are better, then the answer is yes, yes, they are way better. You know, one of the bizarre things that puts us in 2020 is that there is nothing funny coming out of the left. I mean, turn on Colbert or I don't even know who was on late night anymore, Fallon or Kimmel, Kimmel or yeah. Seth Meyers. These are hysterical, petulant children who've ruined comedy. There's nothing funny. I, I watch, I literally watch the same shows I watched in 1989. I watch Old Simpsons and Seinfeld <laughs> I mean, because that's actually still funny while these people become petulant children. So yes, if, if this is about whether the memes of the right were, were better, well, hell yeah, they were better. And the Trump <laughs> memes are hysterical and he also understands that world and that also is the last bastion of sort of free expression at this point because the memes are made often by anonymous people who are putting their stuff out there uh, but Beto is making a point which is that uh, if Biden becomes president and then they've got the presidency and they've got big tech well the day of the funny meme may be over because why would they allow any of these people to be right. online anymore so Sue why do you think that they performed so well with the Hispanic community. Yeah, I mean, in addition to what uh, Dave said, which I think is very, very true. Um, it's also, uh, it, it, I, th I will agree with one small slice of what Beto said, which is Republicans had a better economic message than Democrats did. You know, I mean, if you look at, you know, uh, obviously over, overly generalizing, you have a working class population uh, in these border towns um, who are looking at, at the situation with COVID and saying, you know, it's really easy. I mean, frankly, for us, it's really easy for us to say, hey, go ahead, shut things down if we wanted to. Right. Because we're a, we're a digital business and we all sit here and talk into cameras uh, in our homes or in a studio and we're all very safe and protected. Um, and, you know, our, our jobs go on, you know, like the blaze is flourishing in this environment right now, which is which is great. Uh, if you happen to be a person who works at a restaurant, <laughs> Not so much, right? Like if you happen to be a person who works in a more working class environment that you that is not maybe an essential job, you may be fired. I mean, millions and millions of people lost their job and one side was telling you, look, this is a tough situation. This is not an easy virus to deal with, but we're gonna do everything we can to open up the economy as safely as possible. The other side was telling you, we need to go back into lockdown um, and it's irresponsible to go see your, your family at Thanksgiving. Well, I think that connects with it's, it's it mm. connects less with a suburban upper class sort of demographic that the Republican argument connects a lot more with a working class people mm -hmm. that, that say, like, look, we understand there are risks here, but we need to get out there and, and, and be able to create a livelihood. And I will say, in addition to that, um, and Beto was certainly a part of this sh uh, bunch of shenanigans on the left during the primary. Uh, people with with Latin American heritage have faced actual dictators. They know what socialism is actually like. They've already dealt with it. They've had to deal with it for now. Many of their relatives are still dealing with it in places like Venezuela and Cuba and all throughout Central America. They don't take kindly to hinting towards socialism. Mm -hmm. They don't like it. And, you know, you're just telling them to run away 
And I'm glad they're telling them to run away. I'm glad they're pointing out and they're being more honest about their affinity with socialism and their, their ability to want to grow the government to massive size. But it's not something I think, if, especially if you have um, family who's gone through it and, and has dealt with the terrible outcomes that socialism provides, you're not going to want to entertain that here. You probably came here to escape it. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so I'm not surprised that this has happened. I'm, I'm almost surprised it took this long, but it does seem to be a real movement. I mean, you saw this not only in Texas, but all over the country. South Florida probably is the, the biggest example, but mm -hmm. really all over the country this happened. Yeah, I think you're totally right about that. Okay, so we've got to go to break. First, I want to thank our sponsor, Rough Greens. The dogs have spoken. Well, not literally, but it's pretty evident by the way that they eat their food uh, when it's got rough greens on it anyway. It makes them very happy. So if you're a dog owner, you know that loving your dog, it's only a part of the responsibility you have as his owner. You also have to take good care of him and make sure that you do everything that you can to promote a healthy, happy life for him. And that's why I love rough greens. It isn't a dog food. It's a supplement that you put on your dog's food and it contains all those nutrients that your dog needs, but they get cooked out of all the, the dry kibble food when it's being made. The probiotics, the antioxidants, the vitamins, the minerals, those omega oils, those are just some of the things that your dog needs to lead a healthier lifestyle and they're all the things that are in Rough Greens. So you can get the Rough Greens Jumpstart bag today for just $14.95 and start the process of getting your dog healthier and happier. If you want to see your dog thrive again, just go to roughgreens.com slash blaze. That's R-U-F-F-Greens.com slash blaze. We'll be right back. I think we all expected to hear from Michael Moore in one way or another uh, during this election, but he's now calling for Joe Biden to embrace socialism. He wrote an open letter to Joe Biden. He outlined some actions he wants to see Joe take when he enters the White House. He wrote this on Facebook. He said, you stopped the madness. A grateful nation and myself are in a state of joy, hope, and relief. Thank you for that. We're all eager to join with you to repair the damage done to our country and eliminate that out of our society and our politics that gave us Donald Trump in the first place. He talks about health care, saying it's a human right. Every American must be covered. Everyone must be paid a living wage. Then he said, had Trump won, I'm guessing up to a million people in the next year or so would have died from him ignoring the virus, talking about the coronas, coronavirus pandemic. And then he said, they think because Trump got 70 million votes, the Democrats should reject Black Lives Matter, AOC, and anything that vaguely sounds like socialism at a time when the majority of our citizens under the age of 35, according to most polls, prefer the idea of democratic socialism over the greed of modern day capitalism. Why risk losing them? We need to listen to and understand why they feel this way. They've been saddled with crushing student debt and we've handed them a planet in the middle of its sixth extinction event as their future. He also said it was a mistake that former uh, President Barack Obama made by accepting bipartisanship. He said, I'm sorry, rejecting bipartisanship. And he said, don't let this happen to you. Charge in on January 20th like FDR on steroids. You have no choice. People are dying. You need to sign executive orders, demand and shame Congress into action, go big, eliminate the Electoral College through the National Popular Vote Act. Okay. <laughs> was FDR that, on that, steroids? That was a lot. I did not know that. <laughs> it was a mouthful even for me. So do you think Michael Moore is speaking for the common Democrat? Because he's kind of making it sound like this is how we all feel. Just do it. Michael Moore is the perfect Democrat because he's an absolute fraud who says a whole bunch of stuff that has nothing to do with how he's lived as he's become a millionaire, a multimillionaire in our capitalist system, while at the same time always railing against the very system that has allowed him to eat all of those hamburgers and other <laughs> French fries and all of that fried food. Um, you know, I toured with Jordan Peterson for a year and a half, and uh, one of the things Jordan would talk about in the 12 Rules was uh, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Michael Moore could use a little bit of that. Like, mm. clean your room, man. Like, this guy is so obviously nothing. I, I don't mean this to make this about, like, his weight exactly, but, like, he's nothing that anyone should want to emulate. Like, this, this person who thinks that the system should just do everything for everybody. It's like, if you like all that stuff, man, then bring it to your own life and your own jobs and all of those things. Like, you know, I, I run two businesses and I treat my employees well because I know if I pay them well and treat them well, then they'll work harder for me and that's good. And, and that's the beauty of capitalism.
and he wants to institute a system that will just be bad for everybody so that he can sort of feel better about his guilt as a millionaire, something like that. <laughs> it's like these, these people are just awful. And the sooner we realize that this Hollywood class, and I say this as someone that lives in LA, like the sooner we realize that this Hollywood class, that they behave one way privately and act one way publicly, uh, the better off we'll be. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, as if 2020 was not bad enough, now we have to deal with a happy Michael Moore, yeah. <laughs> which is like, <laughs> might be. Don't don't worry, he's still miserable. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Probably he he's is still miserable. Course. Yeah, I mean, my, look, you know, Michael Moore he really hasn't had a, a moment of relevance other than, you know, I mean, since 2004. You know, we're going back to Fahrenheit 9-11. Uh, um, you know, the one thing that he's done of note since then was to predict Trump's first victory. Um, so he was on the record saying that this is a real thing and this is a real uh, movement and people are going to line up at the polls to vote for this guy. Um, and so he's kind of came back into our lives a little bit because he again predicted Trump was going to win. I guess now he no longer believes that. Uh, but it, it is a, it's he is try The problem with socialism is not, um, you know, wanting to help people. Right. Like mm -hmm. there are some people who especially young um, people who haven't studied this long enough that, to, uh, that, that really think that this is the best way to help people. And, but that is not what the system does. We've seen it happen. It's crushing people. It crushes people's lives. It crushes their livelihoods. It, it, it shortens lifespans. Uh, it it cre creates wars. It creates genocide. This system but has been... besides all that. Besides all that, it's wonderful. On, <laughs> you know, when, when the, the most famous book about your philosophy is the Black Book of Communism, uh, when the Black Book is filled with 100 million dead people uh, this is it's not something we should toy with you can even say like okay we want a bigger do we want this little you know Obamacare do we want to go a little more free market road and, and, and you look at that split and if you picture that split in the road if at the end of the road is what we've seen from communism and socialism over the past century you don't want to even take a few steps down that road let's go the other way where we've seen nonstop prosperity out of the best country on earth for a couple centuries it's worked well here and they keep they t they have to tear down America because they have to deny it's worked well, and then they have to prop up, you know, ridiculous regimes like the Soviet Union and many others since. Do you think that the average Democrat really knows and understands what socialism is? <sighs> no, um, I, I do. I do think that there is even in the polls, like well, they'll show young people or you know favor socialism. I mean, we did this thing <laughs> on the radio show uh, called More on Trivia for many many years, where on Fridays we would predict a football game by calling people who worked at convenience stores and having them answer basic questions about, you know, they wouldn't know the name of the vice president. It was all this sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a tried and true bit. But one of the questions we asked for multiple years to every single, uh, every single week was what is socialism? And with, I would say about 90% of the people over multiple years said, basically described either socializing with each other or a social network, <laughs> right? Yeah. Literally not even understanding it was a political philosophy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, when you see socialism, I think can look okay if you're thinking, oh, I like to be social. I would like socialism. It sounds wonderful. Right. <laughs> uh, but in, I don't think when you look at the, you look at the systems and, and when, when, when people start thinking, you know, young people, like, what are they like, you know? Think about the things, the wonders of, of capitalism and, and particularly combined with the internet that has been brought. Things like Uber and, and, and DoorDash and all of these systems. All of this is unfettered capitalism at some level. I mean, Uber basically just comes into town, doesn't announce itself, and, and you know, the city is saying, no, you can't stay, and they just do it anyway. Like, yeah. that's how unfettered <laughs> they are. And it makes everybody's life better. All those things going away is what socialism would bring. And of course, you know, the people, that's not something that the media tells them, so it takes them a long time to get there. But I do think that when it comes down to it, no one wants 60, 70, 80% of their money gone. Mm -hmm. they, no, no, they want 60, 70, 80% of someone else's money yeah. gone. That's yeah. the thing. Yep. Yeah. That's, it's very true. And I, I think like when you're young and you're not making any money, that sounds great. And when you get, grow up and you're, you're successful and you're trying to provide for your children, sounds not so great. Well, so if just really quickly, if Biden decides to embrace socialism a little bit more than the you know, past presidents have, do you think that will help Trump in 2024 if he does run? It'll ultimately, I think it will help whoever the Republican is, but you know, we shouldn't really be talking about as well that whether Biden will embrace it because I don't think Biden's gonna be in charge. There is something cognitively wrong with him and we know that this is not going to be a four-year president. I, I have no doubt that if, if he does become president, we will basically never hear from this guy. Every, you know, once a month they'll have him read something or he'll do a radio address or something like that. But the idea that Biden is in charge of this thing, and that was the way they smuggled all these bad ideas in. The, the leftist stuff, the socialist stuff, all of it was coming 
but they knew they couldn't get it in through Bernie because it would be too obviously rejected. So instead, they took this 77-year-old walking corpse, in effect, who <laughs> reminds people <laughs> reminds people of the old days. And they were like, do you want the old days? It'll be better than Orange Man. And the, the idea that Biden is going to stop anything is like pretty crazy yeah. to me. All right, we've got to go to break. We'll be right back in just a minute with more. Yeah, that's a perfect description of it. I mean, it just you wait till Ilhan Omar bursts out of his stomach. <laughs> trust me, it's coming. She'll adjust it. Trump supporters are not slowing down anytime soon. They actually have a Stop the Steal mega march planned in D.C. There's also going to be one here in Dallas. So they're going to protest the perceived election fraud and also support President Donald Trump. Um, there are various groups, including Million Manga March, Women for Trump, Stop the Steal DC. They've all invited Trump supporters to participate in this organized protest. It's going to be tomorrow at noon in DC at Freedom Plaza near the White House and along the National Mall. Now, according to um, WDVM TV, there's also going to be some counter protests planned at the Black Lives Matter Plaza. The Metropolitan Police Department released plans for no parking zones. They're also going to have a pretty heavy presence there. Uh, the protests are already being characterized as white nationalist by the mainstream media outlets. Politico reported that Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, Infowar Fanatics, Proud Boys, white nationalists, and neo-Nazis, and the people who would simply call themselves diehard MAGA fans, plan to attend. So local law enforcement, um, and including federal and state law enforcement, too, they're going to be monitoring these protests and make sure that nothing nefarious goes on. Um, a lot of people have been on Twitter that are in support of these protests asking, praying for people to uh, be peaceful, have no conflict, and just come out and show support. I, one thing that's come to my mind is, should people take to the streets anytime they don't agree with something that's happened? Do you find it effective? Do you think that, you know, it's a, a good way to get your voice heard? Yeah, well, it's absolutely your right to do. But I love that they come up with all these groups, like just the scary names of all these groups. Like, why are they like, and the Imperial Stormtroopers will be out there, and Cobra, <laughs> and the Decepticons will be out there, and everybody you can think of, the freaking, who are the bad guys in Star Trek, those guys are going to be there, the Klingons are going to be there. Like, they just make up all of these things. And the th simple fact is, I will go on the record right now. I know that these people will not be violent tomorrow. I was at Trump rallies in Beverly Hills in, you know, Rodeo Drive, like Pretty Woman, you know, the, the elite stores. And there's thousands of people out there with flags, Trump flags, American flags. And it was an absolute love fest. There was nobody racist there. There was nobody bigoted there. But this is what the media does with everything. It, say, it sees something that is true and it shows you the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So these people are out there protesting, which is their right to do. They're not going to burn down stores. How come no stores were burned down? Any, any, did you guys have any no. burned down? I grabbed my lighter, that's How, why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, this is what they do. They tell you that the, it's the right wing militias hunting down people in the streets, burning things down, literally never happened happens and then who who is the one that is burning down all this stuff it's antifa it's black lives matter that are burnt literally burning down cities and creating autonomous zones and all the, the rest of this craziness so i think these people have a right to do it i think they should do it and they'll remain peaceful because they just will because they're they're their ethos is not burn down the system because we didn't get what we want. It's fight for what we believe in. Those are very different things, while mm -hmm. at the same time, the left has said, I mean, Pete Buttigieg said it to Bernie on stage at one of the debates, you want to burn it all down. That is the idea. That is the main idea that has been imported on the left. And as I said before, it's just being covered and given a mask by, by Biden. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, people on the right generally see this as a, uh, a, a, a wonderful system, a wonderful idea of, of America that has its problems and we're trying to protect it from those problems. The left sees it as an inherently flawed racist system that is absolutely terrible and sure, we'll accept it when it gives us what we want. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, what we want to do is burn the whole thing down any way possible, whether it's winning at the ballot box and turning it in through the government, or if we don't win at the ballot box, then literally burning down, <laughs> burning things down. Mm -hmm. Every election of my adult life that the, the Democrats have lost, they have said was stolen from them every single presidential election. I mean, go back, John Kerry, I mean, that wasn't even that, all that close. Uh, they said that was stolen. They said it was stolen in 2000. They said it was stolen uh, you know, in 2016. They spent four years telling us it was Russia and sexism and, and you know, all sorts of shenanigans at the polls. And they, that's all they ever say. 
it's hard to take them seriously. You know, they clearly don't believe in this country as, as it was, you know, initially formed as an idea. And I think we all would acknowledge there's problems here. I mean, we're not perfect and, you know, but these people are inherently out there to protect the system. So they're not gonna burn anything down. You don't need to board up windows when a bunch of right-wingers are going around, you mm -hmm. know? And we, we did, uh, we did a, that rally, um, and we've done many of them, but restoring honor in Washington, D.C. 500,000 people were there for that thing. And Glenn kept saying on the air, you know, don't, don't bring any signs. If they're just gonna take whatever, whatever sign you write up, even if it's a, not that bad, they're gonna take it out of context. Don't dress up like Uncle Sam, you know, don't, don't, you know, do we make sure we take care of the property. Let's leave this thing looking beautiful. You, you, that's exactly what happened. People didn't bring signs. They sat there quietly. They prayed. They were, they were listened to the speeches. And when they left, it was cleaner than when we got there. And that is what, that's what conservatives do. We love this country. We want to try to protect these things. And this is, you know, even if they're wrong, like even if, you know, the election wasn't stolen and this went down a lot better than, you know, it seems at times, they still want to keep the structure here. They just want it to work right. Mm -hmm. And that's the motivation. And that's why this stuff doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah. It's nice to see like-minded people get together and have a peaceful and usually a fun time too. I mean, yeah. everybody that comes out usually has I mean, a great sure, time. maybe you burn down a target. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and there's right. too many of them. Yeah. Right. Let's be it's honest about it. Yeah. Targets, yeah. Too many targets, too many auto zones, too many Wendy's. Yeah, <laughs> pet boys. Pet boys. Oh. All, the ground. Yeah. All right, so this is kind of interesting. Um, a 2019 marriage rate poll, it shows that marriage rates have plunged to an all-time low. So for every 1,000 unmarried adults in 2019, only 33 of them got married. Uh, this number was 35 a decade ago. It was 86 in 1970. So uh, the marriage rate in the United States, at least, in 2018, it dropped to the lowest level ever measured. Why do you think this is happening? And they cite a lot of different reasons for what they think it could be. People aren't um, as religious as they used to be or don't attend church as much. Or, you know, there's not that societal pressure, I think, that there used to be on people getting married. But why do you think that is? Well, I think there's several reasons, some of which you just mentioned. But I think it's also just sort of a delayed feeling of adulthood. It's just that we're not teaching people to be adults. So I mentioned before I was on tour with Jordan Peterson and what I saw was, you know, the media would talk about it in a way that he's talking to these angry young men as if, as if, if you were talking to angry young men, that's inherently evil. Well, if, if young men have a problem and that's leading them to be angry, which by the way, wasn't even the case at the events. The events were, were filled with all sorts oh, of really diverse fun. people they're and really wonderful fun, and fun and all of those things. But, but if, if that is true, that there's a, a group of young men, let's say, that are angry or, or feel uh, despondent about what's going on here, and you're talking to them to help get them to, to get their lives in order and all of those things, well, then that's good. But the media, of course, framed it the other way. But the, re the way I would connect it to this is if you keep people as children for a long time, so we know that all these people now go to college and then come home and live with their parents and then don't get out of the basement and all of these things, and they think that that's okay. And then, you know, you could couple this with the weird ways that feminism has gone, where you, you would hold old door for a woman. And now, if you do that, she's going to yell at you because <laughs> it means you're, you're an anti You know, like it's all, it's all sort of crazy. So we've given young people, I think, a very odd, conflicting world that has been coupled by social media and all the weirdness out of that. And then they don't know how to be adults. And then I think you take two people that are 25 that don't really know how to be adults that maybe would have got married you know, a decade ago, and they're just like, ah, let's, let's see what else is there. Right, I yeah. think that's a great description. Yeah. All right, we have to go to break. I'm married, I love it. We'll be yeah. right back. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, yeah, it was a little later in life. Well, because... if your husband's not watching, you don't need to say that. Oh, okay, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it's all right. <laughs> 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 Yesterday we asked you, do you think President Trump will ultimately win the election in the courts? 70.4% of you said yes, 29.6% of you said no. Very optimistic. All right, the question for today is, do you plan to change your Thanksgiving Christmas holiday plans based on recent comments from politicians? Yes, no, or unsure? No, I am going to have people over. We are going to eat and have fun and drink and touch each other and, and maybe what share. Kind of Thanksgiving are you having? <laughs> well, I mean, hands around okay, the table okay. or something. We're, I mean, we're gonna. We might share the spoon. We might put the stuffing out in the middle of the table, and you're gonna have to touch the spoon, and someone else is gonna have to touch the spoon. I know. 
I know, I'm a radical, what can I tell you? You are a total rebel, what about you, Stu? I've invited Dr. Fauci uh, to my Thanksgiving. <laughs> if he shows up, we're gonna listen to him. Other than that, we're gonna do it. Forget it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like what you said, like, when they suggest bring your own food to Thanksgiving, no, I don't think That's so. That's not yeah. Thanksgiving. I'm showing up for somebody else to make me a meal and I'm sharing with everybody. All right, thank you for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. It was so much fun.